Thank you, Mr. Masha. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. So, on behalf of the Department of Political Science, Law, and International Studies, I am very pleased to welcome you uh, to the conference Pivoting in Class with Governance of the EU Fundamental Values. Since from 1992, mostly as a result of the judicial activism of the European Court of Justice, rule of law, democracy, and human rights have become the distinguishing features of the European Union and the main overall purpose for its very existence. Such notions have become the legal and political concretization of the European values. Since then, decisions and mechanisms on both political and legal dimension had to transfer these features into concrete action. Moreover, to overcome the democratic deficit that was widely underlined uh, within the debate on the feasibility and the legitimacy of the European Constitution, the European public sphere remained to be fostered, uh, if not constructed at all, in the frame of multi-level co governance. Meanwhile, the social and political conditions within the member states and outside the European Union changed. New challenges emerged, many processes and phenomena have undermined the purpose of a values-based integration at the European level. Let us think of the financial crisis with uh, its impact on the regression in social rights fulfillment, or of the wave of populists, and recently the pandemic. The pandemic itself underlined both the fragility and the potential of the European Union institutions. So rule of law, democracy, and human rights have to face all these challenges and uh, always call for interpretations and for leading implementation. The way they are partial and the way they are in concreteness within, within actions and mechanisms are still under critique and are all being constantly analyzed. This conference gives us an excellent chance for this critical inquiry and also for discussing prospective solutions to pitfalls. In order to strengthen the compliance with rule of law, democracy, and human rights through the European Union initiatives. The conference frame is promising for assessing the current situation as to the uh, EU from values, promotion, and protection, since it gathers scholars from different disciplinary perspectives, as well as experts and practitioners. Uh, at all the involved levels of governance. Let me thank, therefore, the event partners, starting from the Human Rights Center Antonita Pisca and the UN UNESCO Chair of Human Rights, Democracy and Peace at the University of Padua, the School of Global Studies at the University of Gothenburg, the Department of Law at the University of Zagreb, the Human Rights Consortium, uh, at the University of London, um, the UNESCO International Center for the Promotion of Human Rights in the local and regional levels, and the UNESCO Chair, Human Rights and Human Security at the University of Graz, the Institute of International Studies of the University of Rotterdam, and the Institute de Droit de l'Homme 
uh, at Lyon Catholic University. Uh, let me thank uh, all the speakers in the plenary sessions, uh, as well as in the parallel sessions, and uh, of course, all the participants uh, in presence and uh, uh, online in this conference. I wish uh, a, a fruitful conference. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And I'm, now I'm pleased to give the floor of the director of the Human Rights Center at the University of Padua, Professor Gabriela Salviolo. Thank you, Marco. Greetings at all again. Good morning to people present here. Maybe good afternoon, maybe good evening to people active uh, in streaming. It's a great emotion to bring the greetings of the Human Rights Center, Antonio Battista of the University of Padua, and my personal to all of you participants in the conference that opens in this prestigious venue, the Archivio Antico of the University of Padua. I also extend a warm welcome to all of you because in the afternoon, the work will cont continue in the headquarters of the Human Rights Center our center. I would therefore like to thank my colleagues, staff, and all the collaborators who have made possible to carry out the afternoon session of the conference. I greet Professoressa Elena Cariotti, Professor Marco Mascia, whom I thank for the passion with the, which he led for many years the Human Rights Center, the oldest in Italy. The center is preparing to celebrate the 40th anniversary of its foundation, little compared to the 800 years of Padua University, but a significant milestone for the center itself. On October 2021, the first celebrations for the 800th anniversary of the university open. On December the 10th, International Human Rights Day will open the celebrations of the Center 40th anniversary. They will close on December 2022, the 10th. It will be a year of celebration and reflection on its own history and, above all, on its own future. As concerned myself, directing the Center is an honor and the responsibility for two reasons. The first one, the center is an important unit of Padova University whose excellent reputation is recognized in the national and international scientific panorama. The second reason, the second reason is that I'm not a human rights science, but I am a mineralogist. My specific research topic is environmental mineralogy. So my personal challenge is to study the relationship between environmental, lato sensu, and human rights. I'm also deeply convinced that the perspective of human rights is like a pair of glasses that help to face the complex situations that characterize our time in a deep and articular, articulated transdisciplinary way. I am therefore honored and consider this, this opportunity as a privilege. The conference that opens today is a consolidated appointment between the activities of the Human Rights Center, the Department of Political Science, and the UNESCO CERN. I therefore thank Elena Pariotti and Marco Mascia for their fruitful, fruitful collaboration. I also like to thank all the other partners who I do not name for time saving. The phone conference is an expected meeting to reflect on the state of the art and perspective, perspectives of the teams chosen from time to time. In fact, it is the task of scientific research to launch the challenges and indicate the possible ways to overcome them. It is the responsibility of researchers and research structures to disseminate knowledge, 
to that, on the one hand, competence is increased through teaching activity. And on the other hand, it operates in a fertile way in society through relations with the territory. The team uh, chosen for the 2021 edition fully fulfilled the task, setting itself the goal of critically analyzing causes, challenges, and responses on the ongoing value crisis in the Euro European space, primarily rep represented by trends of democratic backsliding in some European countries. As reported in the concept note of the conference, I'd like uh, to stress that for several years, the European institutions have been facing significant threats and challenges to the maintenance of their fundamental values by the gover governments of some member states. In this context, the European Union seeks to create mechanisms to monitor and possible uh, sanction countries that violate or threaten fundamental values. Despite the much progress made in terms of initiatives, these mechanisms are still ineffective, even for the limited effective institutional cooperation between the European institutions. The conference, in addition to taking stock of the situation, wants to evaluate the measure taken and their effectiveness and evaluate the actual possibilities for the plural and multilevel inclusive governance to address the current challenge to the founding values in a cohesive and effective way. I therefore wish you all good work and thank for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Gabriella. Just, uh, just a few words on the theme of the, of the conference. The assumption from which we start is that the choice of democracy is an obligatory choice, because the only one that allows us to respond synergically to the challenge of integration coming from the great process of change and the way with the planetary range of action. Some question as when talking about democracy. Is the culture of democracy suitable for facing the complexity and geopolitical expansion of the problems of our time? Are planetary interdependence and democracy compatible? Is the nation state today the main obstacle to the recovery and development of democracy even within it? Is the time to come a time for democracy or what else? Recalling Ross' text, Why Democracy? How to combine together quality and quantity, procedure and substance, the how, the what, and the where of democracy. We are meeting to talk about human rights and democracy in an era in which the human rights and fundamental freedom are challenged in Europe and worldwide by the economic crisis, the climate crisis, the migration crisis, the authoritarian drift, but also by a resurgence of statism, sovereignty, nationalism. In an era in which the world economy continues to remain extraneous to social justice, conditioned as it is by the myth of the market and penalized by the caused by neoliberalism. In an era in which violence, wars, terrorism, rearmament, autocratic and dictatorial tendencies increasingly tighten the human condition in the grip of insecurity. Leaderships, with all due exceptions, seem paralyzed in their inability to defend life and promote the dignity of all members of the human family and their equal rights. The main concern is the short and egoist horizon of the next election appointment. Democracy is faltering even in the countries with a democratic tradition. Some European Union member states are 
adopting legislation that violated the principle of the rule of law and restricted the spaces of organized civil society. It's a clear limitation of some fundamental freedoms, from the right of peaceful assembly to the right of association, from the right of information to the right to freedom of movement. The interdependence of the of the judiciary must deal with an aggressive policy that considers the rule of law not a fundamental right, but an optional. In the so-called advanced democracy systems, political parties have become the oligopolistic manager of the democratic method, that is, of the electoral practice. Gradually, through the exclusive management of political democracy, the political parties have occupied the state, government, and parliament, and in some countries, even society. The, to bring democracy back to the axiological bomb, as Professor Papiska said, which is precisely that of human rights, it is necessary to refer to the international recognition of human rights. Democracy is not only the natural method of implementing human rights, it is itself recognized as a fundamental right by international legal instruments. States have a legal obligation to give themselves a democratic regime. In the periodic reports that states are required to submit to international human rights bodies, states must account for how they fulfill the obligation of democracy, recognize international covenant on civil and political rights and the international covenant on economic, social and cultural rights. The acceptance of human rights as basic needs of the person and the definitive acceptance of the principle of interdependence and divisibility of all human rights support the thesis according to which economic democracy is inseparable from political democracy. Human rights postulate integral democracy. The issue of the protection of the rule of law and democratic principle has become a priority on the political agenda of international institutions. Article 2 of the Treaty on the European Union states that the rule of law is, together with the respect for human rights, freedom, democracy, equality, and human rights, one of the founding values of the European Union and its member states, and specifies that these values are common to the member states. The foundation of the European Union on these principles is also reaffirmed in the preamble of the European Union Charter of Fundamental Rights, which, with the Lisbon Treaty, has assumed the same legal value as the treaties. The rule of law is also one of the principles to be respected for European Union membership. It is also one of the principles on which the European Union action of the external relation is based and which it aims to promote in the world. The Council of Europe has been active since its establishment for the protection of human rights and democratic principles in its member state, in particular to the European Convention on Human Rights and Fundamental Freedom. The ongoing debate at the United Nations on the rule of law at the national and international level has developed since 2000 with a series of General Assembly resolutions and reports from the Secretary General. In 2012, the General Assembly adopted the solemn declaration of the high-level meeting of the United Nations General Assembly on the rule of law at the national and international levels, which reaffirmed that human rights, the rule of law and democracy are interconnected and mutually reinforcing and which belong to the core of universal and indivisible values and principle of the United Nations. The novelty is the fact that the question of respect of the rule of law by virtue, by virtue of the international legal recognition of human rights is addressed with reference to both national political systems and the international political system. 
The process of internationalization of human rights, in fact, requires that the system, the system in which it took place, precisely that of the United Nations and other international organizations, conform to the principle of the rule of the law and develop structures and methods that are themselves democratic. So, not only international organizations, but also local authorities are active to promote the rule of law, human rights, and democratic principles. Given that the local authority in the era of planetary interdependence must directly address problems that are of world order and that require global solutions, it follows that the local authority is fully entitled to interact with the system of trans and supranational governance within the framework of multi-level governance architecture. The local authorities, as the original territorial pole of subsidiarity, can and must claim roles of democratic participation in the decision-making processes of multilateral institutions, also due to the many years of experience gained internationally. The Committee of the Regions of the European Union has adopted a series of opinions to elucidate the contributions that local authority, authorities can make in protecting the rule of law in the European Union. For the Committee of the Regions, the question of respect of the principle of the rule of law must be addressed within the framework of multilevel governance and the principle of subsidiarity. It argued that the rule of law functions at multiple levels in the European Union and must therefore also be protected in the interaction between these levels. In conclusion, a fundamental way to recover and strengthen democracy is what we can define as educational mobilization. The culture of peace and human rights directly challenges the world of formal and informal education as advocated by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The declaration in the preamble is proposed as a, as a common standard of achievement for all peoples and all nations to the end that every individual and every organ of society, keeping this declaration constantly in mind, shall strive for teaching and education to promote respect for rights and freedoms. International human rights law for its implementation requires not only formal act of implementation by states, but also and above all knowledge motivation and the responsibility of the right holders, individually and collectively concerned. Nevertheless, today, the universitas has to take on the responsibility of explaining the new complexity of life on the planet and of suggesting hypotheses for an answer to the problems posed by world interdependence. The university is obliged to rediscover its natural vocation as universitas, which is to docere, that is to transmit the knowledge, skill, and value necessary to build a more just and democratic society where all human rights are respected for all. I thank you for your kind attention and wish you a fruitful conference. And now, I give the floor to Gerd Oberleitner of the University of Graz, Chair of the Planning Session. Thank you. Yeah, please.
Good morning again. Uh, good morning and welcome to uh, this morning session, this first plenary session in this wonderful conference. Uh, I have the pleasure and the privilege uh, to chair this plenary session. Uh, my name is Gerd Oberleitner. I'm a professor of international law and uh, UNESCO chair in human rights and human security at the University of Graz, uh, which is among the proud supporters and partners of this conference, not for the first time. So it's a great pleasure to be here again uh, in this framework and in, in wonderful Padova. Um, and uh, we are opening this uh, morning and this conference with a session on the title, Setting the Frame Towards an Inclusive Governance of EU Fundamental Values. Uh, and in order to enlighten us on this topic uh, and to start a discussion for the plenary sessions in the afternoon, which will then lead to the session tomorrow, we have three uh, experts in the field with us who will be able to kick us off to hopefully interesting discussions, debates, and plenary sessions uh, in the afternoon. Uh, Professor Dimitri uh, Kolchinov from the Central European University, um, Professor Laurent Pech from Middlesex University London, and online uh, Francesca Strumia from the University of Sheffield. I will introduce them to you in a moment when they take the floor. Um, we have uh, uh, a title to kick us off, which I think in itself would already give enough substance for discussion and debate, even without the high level interventions that we will have. Um, as it is called, setting the frame towards an inclusive governance of EU fundamental values. And uh, each of these words in the title in itself lends to a debate. We are meant to set the frame, to create a framework uh, for a more or less holistic understanding of the debate that we will have and that Professor Masha has laid out in all its breadth a moment ago. Uh, from the rule of law to democracy to human rights uh, to uh, uh, the issues that we have to discuss. And we will see if we can achieve uh, this exercise of setting a frame and deepen it in the afternoon's plenary session. We're meant to move towards an inclusive governance of EU fundamental values, which obviously means we're not there yet, we never might be. So we discuss a movement or a process. Uh, in reality, of course, we discuss a backlash, uh, as we will see in a moment. Uh, we will be discussing the link between values and governance, and the question whether the European Union is governed by values, or whether the Union contributes to the government by values, or whether values are disruptive for the government and governance in the EU. Uh, and the organizers have rightly put EU fundamental values in question and put us in quotation marks. Uh, so, of course, a debate on the very notion of values uh, and fundamental values and core values and not so core values is something that we also need to have. Uh, we are in a lucky position to have uh, three colleagues who will do all this uh, and will shed light on this. Uh, with their with their vast experience. Uh, before I give the floor to the first speaker, just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, we have uh, two hours at our disposal, so the idea is that each speaker will have roughly 20 minutes to talk, which should leave us enough time for discussion and debate afterwards. Uh, I'm asked for those of you who are in the room, if they wish to intervene, please to come here and use the microphone, because otherwise the uh, participants online will not be able to hear you, so please identify yourself and move towards here. And we will also try, uh, with the help of colleagues here, of course, to include all those being present online. The uh, beauty and horror of hybrid sessions of uh, sessions is that we have many participants, but not all of them are in the room, so we need to include them as good as we as, good as we can. Um, we have also uh, agreed to change the order of appearance slightly to start with Laurent Bech to give more of an overview of the topic. Um, then followed, if I understand rightly, by Dimitri as the second speaker, if that is okay with you, uh, and, and Francesca Strumia as uh, third speaker, if that is acceptable to all, the, to all the colleagues. And of course, my hope is also that Francesca can hear us and see us uh, and will identify herself when, when the time comes. 
but perhaps, uh, and can we just have a quick check if, if Francesca is really is really online and follow us? Yes, I. Good morning, everyone. I can hear you very well. Can you hear me? Good morning. We can hear you. It's okay, good. Okay, perfect. You, even though only online, there she is. Wonderful. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Um, so let me immediately start with the speakers because it's them you want to hear. Uh, Perhaps as, as the first speaker, who is a professor of European law and the Chamonix chair of European public law uh, and the head of law and politics department at Middlesex University in London, um, has been a visiting professor of law at various universities, including Bordeaux University, um, and uh, was appointed Fernand Baudel Fellow at the European University Institute. And if I understand correctly, is currently working on a Horizon 2020 project on reconciling Europe with its citizens through democracy and the rule of law. And among his uh, research activities and areas is the topic that will concern us most, which is democratic backsliding in the European Union. Um, he um, is also the author of uh, books and publications on the rule of law in the European Union, the scope of application of European human rights standards, uh, the right to free speech, uh, and I have found that his perhaps most recent publication is something that I'm sure we will be discussing today, Protecting Polish Judges from Poland's Disciplinary Chamber, just published this year. Um, Laurent, the floor is all yours. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and uh, bonjour everyone. Um, I have uh, 20 minutes to kind of give you a broad uh, introductory uh, overview. Thank you very much. Uh, which is not easy. So I, I decided that uh, I would give you, I'm going to focus on two main issues, essentially how EU values are being systemically uh, uh, undermined by, authority, by autocratic authorities. So I'm going to spend my 20 minutes explaining how EU values are, are being undermined. So the, the blueprint being used uh, in the past 10 years. And then uh, I'm going to um, describe some of the cross-cutting challenges uh, this is raising from the point of view of promoting and upholding uh, EU values. Um, so uh, let me begin with uh, some uh, uh, basic description of uh, the legal framework. I'm a lawyer after all, so we like to always uh, get started uh, with treaty provisions. And uh, according to the EU treaties, it has been clear at least since uh, 1992 uh, that the EU is based on a number of shared values. So it's not simply the EU's value, but a number of values we share, all the member states are supposed to share and which governs, in fact, in fact, accession to the EU. So you cannot join the EU unless you commit yourself to applying and promoting these values, such as democracy, the rule of law, respect for human rights. So these values have been mentioned in the treaty for quite some time. And in fact, before they were mentioned in the treaties, uh, the, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the first time the EU referred to democracy, rule of law, and respect for human rights as the core uh, of its constitutional identity, that was in 1973. So even before the treaty codification of these values, uh, these values were quite consensual. Um, uh, yeah, the first time I saw them mentioned was the European Declaration, the Declaration on European Identity of December 1973. Social justice was also uh, added uh, to this uh, list of values. Social justice found also its way back in the treaties, actually after the Treaty of Lisbon, uh, which entered into force in 2010. Uh, from a, a legal point of view, sorry, it's just a, a here echo when it's closed, but um, um, so I would rather move it away from the, uh, sorry. Uh, but if you cannot hear me, I can just uh, raise my voice. Um, so essentially, uh, let's move uh, to the situation today. According to the Court of Justice, um, uh, the EU legal structure is, uh, we have a legal structure, an interconnected legal system in the EU, which is based on one fundamental premise. And I'm citing here the Court of Justice of the EU. The fundamental premise on which the EU legal system is based is actually uh, 
quite uh, straightforward. It is based on the assumption that each member state shares with all the other member states the set of common values laid down in Article 2T. So this is the fundamental premise organizing the entire EU legal system. If this premise goes, then the EU legal system ceases to operate and function properly. Now, uh, this has been, this fundamental premise is under challenge uh, to the extent that we've been witnessing in the EU a process of uh, democratic and rule of law backslide. I will explain this process and how does this work. But this is the main, I think, fundamental challenge for, today, for us today in this room to see or does this impact on promotion, compliance, and respect for EU values, both internally and externally. I explained both dimensions as well. EU institutions have struggled for the past uh, 10 years to deal with uh, what we can call democratic and rule of law backsliding. Just last week, in a rather dramatic, unprecedented intervention, the president of the European Court of Justice at the FIDE conference last week uh, said, we are facing an extremely serious situation and I'm quoting here, I believe it is an exaggeration to say that the foundations of the EU as a union based on the rule of law are under threat and that the very survival of the European project in its current form is at stake. I had never heard the president of the Court of Justice referring to the survival of the system. So things are pretty bad, if you don't mind me being informal. We shall see if the EU institutions are going to wake up. This is an unprecedented call for action implicitly by the President of the European Court of Justice. Now, today my time is limited, so I cannot really give you an overview of all the violations of uh, Article 2 TU values we have witnessed in the past 10 years. What I'm going to do, I'm going to focus on two points, as I said. How authoritarian populists uh, try to organize the systemic violation of Article 2 values. And then I'm going to tell you about some of the challenges this has created, mostly from the EU's point of view. Now, to begin uh, my uh, keynote, authoritarian populists undermine EU's share value. Uh, in my scholarship, I have, uh, refer I have spoken of uh, rule of law backsliding, but in fact, uh, rule of law backsliding could also be described as democratic and rule of law backsliding. All the, the values are being undermined uh, through the same process. In my scholarship, I have defined uh, with Professor Chapelet rule of law backsliding as a process, but a deliberate process through which elected public authorities deliberately implement governmental blueprints which aim to systemically weaken, annihilate, or capture internal checks on power. Why would you do that? This is a deliberate process of undermining Article 2 EU values. What's the long term goal here? The long-term goal, I'm afraid, is uh, the re-establishment of a de facto one-party state, dismantling the liberal democratic state in the process. So we end up with a de facto autocratic regime, authoritarian regime, and perhaps people don't realize that, but we already have one EU member state, which is no longer a democracy in the EU, but people are pretending it's not the case. Gary is no longer described as a democracy by democracy experts since 2019. Now, while I have described this as a process of rule of law backsliding, in fact, uh, you can see the links with human rights and democracy quite clearly. Rule of law backsliding, when the process has concluded, usually ends up with uh, radical changes to the electoral framework, making it virtually impossible for the ruling party to lose elections because elections have been structurally rigged. So elections are still free, but they're no longer structurally fair. And human rights, once the system has been captured, obviously, uh, human rights, especially the human rights of minorities or women's rights, think about Poland, uh, what's happening in this weekend demonstrations. Uh, there's always a, a direct link between rule of law backsliding and then an impact on a democratic structure and respect for human rights. Um, now, what does this work in, in some steps? I just have to give you a, a simplistic overview uh, due to time limitation, but usually uh, would be autocrats that tend to emerge in a specific context and follow the same constitutional capture recipe. So you have a lot of uh, common uh, features, regardless of the country and regardless of the different history and legal traditions. So usually you have free and fair elections um, and these uh, new autocrats, they get elected free and fairly, uh, but they tend to be elected usually in a context where there is a, a political crisis or there is a crisis in the party system 
a loss of faith in the system and some economic issues, housing inequality or cost of living issues, then they make promises. Uh, they're going to solve all the problems. Once they are elected, uh, following free and fair elections, then they tend for the first time to rely on the will of the people rhetoric. So if you see will of the people, then you can be sure that you are dealing with an authoritarian populist. And then on, in the name of the will of the people, they start dismantling uh, the rule of law. Uh, quite strikingly, in the case of Poland and Hungary, in cases, Orban was elected and Kaczynski was essentially won the election without mentioning anything about dismantling the rule of law. So Orban was never elected, uh, never had popular permission to actually undertake a constitutional autocratic revolution in 2010. Same for uh, Polish authorities at the end of 2015. They never, there was a, a brief mention in the electoral uh, uh, platform of uh, some judicial reforms, but th that's it. Uh, they were given permission to, un to essentially undertake what can be described as a, as a slow motion constitutional coup d'etat. Now, how does it work? If you have uh, new autocrats elected, then you can distinguish, I distinguish myself between primary targets and secondary targets. So uh, what do I mean by primary targets of the new autocrats? They always, as soon as they are elected to, this, to undermine the system or to capture the system, they will always systematically target the constitutional court or Supreme Court or both if you have in your country a constitutional court and a Supreme Court, and then the public broadcaster. They need the public broadcaster in order to normalize uh, the dramatic violations of the rule of law they are undertaking in order to capture legally or illegally, uh, as it happened in Poland, the constitutional court. Then the Supreme Court. Why is it so important to capture the constitutional court if you have one? Because then you can give a veneer of legality to the manifest unconstitutional actions that you are undertaking. You're saying, no, I'm not violating the constitution. Look, the constitutional court I've just captured in breach of the constitution is saying differently. Uh, once the primary, uh, or in addition to the primary targets, I should mention also the public prosecutor's office. So this is key. Uh, then once you have captured the public prosecutor's office, then you can stop criminal investigations against you and your friends. And you can also launch criminal investigations against people you don't like. So once you have the constitutional court, court the public broadcaster and the prosecutor's general's office uh, captured indirectly or directly, then you can move on to secondary targets. I'm afraid us in this room, secondary targets of autocrats, universities, academics, uh, ordinary court judges, uh, journalists, lawyers, um, national regulatory bodies should remain normally independent under EU law, everyone and civil society groups. So they are part of uh, secondary targets. These secondary targets are attacked uh, mind through uh, uh, either collectively or individually or both at the same time. So, for instance, uh, uh, to undermine the rule of law, you're going to attack the court's judiciary in its collectivity, in its globality. And at the same time, you're going to target individual judges. You're going you're gonna to specifically target those who are the most outspoken, and you're going to target them through formal means or informal means. Formal means, disciplinary investigation, uh, fake criminal charges, informal means, uh, uh, hate campaigns, uh, uh, informal threats uh, to the judge or to the family members. And what I'm describing here, it's happening. So it's not like, uh, uh, you know, I'm giving you an abstract. I can multiply, uh, I can give you hundreds and hundreds of examples of uh, individual targeting of secondary, so-called secondary targets. Same for academics. Um, you know, think about, for instance, Professor Sadiorski, uh, a colleague of ours, who has been the subject of six or seven uh, lawsuits in Poland, either of a criminal nature, of a civil nature, either directly by the ruling party or through proxies. Autocrats also tend to use proxies to uh, target secondary targets. So uh, when they, for instance, when they're going to target the media outlet, they're not going to do that directly. They're going to go through a, a third party, which they control. Anyway, so once the secondary targets have been uh, subjugated or annihilated or scared into submission, then the end of the process is a revamping of the electoral framework. So then you're making sure that you're not going to lose the elections because you have already captured the electoral commission, the uh, media authority, the competition authority, plus uh, you have made sure that the judges in charge of uh, uh, or, uh, overviewing the elections are actually uh, judges that you yourself appointed either regularly or irregularly. So the system has been completely captured. 
you have two options if you are unlucky enough to be in such a system. Either, uh, I mean, you have three options. Either you fight, but then you can, uh, um, this will have a dramatic impact on your professional prospects, or you sell out and then you're going to be promoted very quickly. Or otherwise, third option, you just leave the country, uh, which has been the third option, has been the most popular in Hungary. If you look at the figures in terms of migration, it's just actually quite scary. Anyway, so this is essentially the autocratic playbook. Uh, how does it work? And it ends with free but structurally unfair elections. Um, as you can see, then the link between rule of law backsliding, democracy, and human rights should be obvious. Uh, uh, I didn't mention minorities uh, in this process, but minorities are also targeted. But in a way, they also fulfill a different function, uh, is that they fulfill the function of the distraction and the scapegoating uh, uh, function, which is quite useful for autocrats. You always need scapegoats to distract people while you're undermining uh, the rule of democracy uh, and uh, respect for human rights. Now, let me then move on to the second item of my, uh, my keynote this morning, uh, the cross cut challenges uh, this, this process of rule of law and democratic backsliding has created from the point of view of Article 2 uh, values. And I'm going to distinguish between uh, pre-2010 uh, challenges and post-2010 uh, challenges. Why 2010? Because 2010 was when Orban was re-elected. And this is essentially the dividing uh, date I use to, to mark the, the start of this process of rule of law backsliding in the EU. Uh, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to distinguish uh, pre three pre-2010 challenges, uh, the delivery challenge, the effectiveness challenge, and the coherence challenge. I'm just going to be uh, brief, uh, of course. Uh, by delivery challenge, um, this has been a recurrent challenge from the point of view of promotion and compliance with EU values. Uh, by this, I understand the, the traditional difficulties uh, that the EU has faced when it comes to moving beyond strong rhetoric and commitment to actual delivery. The EU is very good when it comes to uh, strong rhetoric, uh, publishing statements. Uh, when it comes to actual delivery of the statements, uh, then there is a big uh, gap. And this is not merely true in the context of EU external relations law, but it's also true from an internal uh, point of view. Effectiveness challenge is closely related to the delivery challenge. Uh, the EU has long been accused of uh, being ineffective uh, when it comes to promoting EU values, uh, both externally uh, and more recently internally. Uh, something which is possibly worth mentioning in this respect is the past 10 years we have seen the multiplication of action plans, which is new. Uh, before 2010, we never had really this kind of action plans. And uh, let me just mention two examples. Uh, first action plan on human rights and democracy uh, was uh, the issue of this treaty. So that was external action plan. Initially, we didn't have any internal action plan, but I guess because of the process of rule of law backsliding. We have had the first democracy action plan published by the Commission in uh, December 2020. So that is 10 years exactly, essentially, after the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty. So the Commission, seemingly, is waking up to the fact that democracy is under threat, not only outside of the EU's borders, but also internally. Uh, third challenge, the coherence challenge, another uh, traditional challenge. Um, Consistency or coherence, um, this has been a, a, a recurrent challenge uh, from the point of view of EU external relations law. The EU in this context has been quite often accused of double standards. And this double standard accusation actually has also emerged in, uh, with, within uh, the EU itself. Um, there is also in this context, we spent a lot of time discussing the disconnect between how the EU is so demanding uh, with respect to EU candidate countries and then uh, stops uh, being demanding once you have joined the club. Uh, but also, in fact, uh, then it's connected to the effectiveness challenge because even though the EU has been demanding to, uh, as regards EU Canada country, Professor Kachanov is the expert, it, uh, it was never done properly anyway, the monitoring in the context of EU enlargement policy, which is why uh, essentially we faced some internal issues post accession. Now, let me move on uh, to uh, post new cross cutting challenges, which are more directly connected. Uh, to the process of rule of law backsliding. And I'm just gonna mention two because my time is limited. I'm gonna mention the credibility challenge and uh, another one, uh, which is I think less uh, well known, 
what I call, uh, it's not very nice, but uh, I couldn't think of something better to call it, the authoritarian gangrenization of the bee. So that's the, the latest challenge. There is a process of auto autocratic or authoritarian gangrenization of the internal EU structure. I'll explain in a minute. The credibility challenge is easier to understand. The EU likes to uh, portray itself as a global normative power external, when acting externally. And internally, the EU likes to define itself as a community of democracies. But then when you compare the rhetoric to the actual reality in a post-2010 context, then uh, these two claims, these two self-representations are completely mined by the EU's ineffectiveness at dealing with this process of rule of law backsliding. We have been unable not because we like the tools, that's one of my key findings after my research, I can tell you, the issue has never been the toolbox, and unlike, unless, uh, unlike what you can hear often from EU actors, the key issue has been the lack of willingness to use properly uh, whatever tools we had. Uh, but so we, there is a credibility challenge because for today, there, is no, there has not been a single formal acknowledgement, as far as I know, that Hungary is no longer a democracy. There is in the official uh, communications of the EU, Hungary is a fully fledged member of the EU, still considered a democracy. Uh, the US uh, Biden administration agrees, and Hungary is the only EU member state not to have been invited to the Democracy Summit or in Washington, D.C., organized by the Biden administration. Reaction from the EU? Nada not even a single acknowledgement that there must be something wrong if the US federal government doesn't consider Hungary to be a democracy and therefore not worthy of an invitation to the democracy summit. Uh, the, the, the main EU candidate country, Serbia, no, has not been invited either. Why? Because Serbia has also uh, been the subject of a very intense, deliberate process of democratic and rule of law backsliding, which is reaction. Well, Let's look the other way and pretend it's not happening. So there is, this is the credibility challenge, which, which has gotten worse uh, post-2010. The last challenge uh, I'd like to finish with is the authoritarian gangrene challenge. By not meaningfully and decisively confronting Orban and then Kaczynski, uh, now uh, EU institutions have allowed in turn the autocratic uh, gangrenization of the EU. Now, what do I mean? It's not simple. The EU decision making and policy making processes, which are now affected by these uh, autocrats. Uh, we have now serious consequences when it comes to the application of EU policy, control of EU funds going to these countries. And most recently, the EU system of judicial remedies is also being affected for the first time. Uh, let me just give you some uh, examples too, and then we can perhaps uh, I can rebound on these examples during the, the QA. Uh, just recently, uh, the Hungarian commissioner uh, was found to have attempted to uh, uh, manufacture or, or censor the EU enlargement uh, reports, uh, the rule of law section of the Serbian uh, enlargement report. So he overruled his own civil servants to pretend that the rule of law in Serbia was doing well. So this is what I mean by authoritarian gangrenization of the commission from within the commission itself, with some attempt to doctor the internal, the official policy documents for partisan reasons. So essentially doing uh, Hungary's foreign policy through the Commission's enlargement um, uh, reports. Orban's Hungary is also systematically uh, refusing to adopt council conclusions dealing with human rights as soon as uh, there is a mention to LGBT. So Poland as well. So now the council is unable to adopt, uh, most recently, uh, the council was unable to adopt uh, the, children, the children rights strategy because there was a, a reference uh, LGBT uh, in the, uh, the draft uh, strategy. The European Parliament also has now a number of MEPs who have been elected on the back of completely structurally rigged elections, Hungary, Poland, according to the USD. The EU's reaction is not happening, uh, not paying any attention to the findings of the OSC when it comes to unfair elections uh, in Hungary and Poland. In Hungary, they haven't had fair elections since 2010. No surprise that uh, ten, 10 years later, you end up with what is no longer a democratic system. But this MEP sadly define uh, EU law. 
So our rights and obligations are in part in this room, our rights and our own rights and obligations are defined in part by non-democratic actors. I don't know how this makes you feel, but it doesn't make me feel good, especially when also my EU taxes are being spent by non-democratic authorities. New challenges are also emerging in relation to mutual trust-based EU policies, such as the EU framework, such as the European Hours Warrant uh, framework decision. So more and more national courts now are reluctant to recognize uh, 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 surrender. Uh, so I don't want to uh, be too technical, but essentially national courts now are more inclined to refuse any surrender of any criminal suspect to Poland due to the systemic deficiencies regarding the rule of law. And last example I'd like to uh, leave with you is that the Court of Justice for the first time this year has faced, uh, uh, has received a number of questions uh, under the preliminary ruling jurisdiction of the Court of Justice from people who are clearly uh, what we call in my scholarship informally fake judges. So essentially manifestly irregularly and indiv appointed individuals to judicial positions. In Poland, half of the Supreme Court consists of irregularly appointed judges, so they are not lawful judges. But for the first time, these unlawful judges are trying to legitimize themselves by asking the Court of Justice to answer points of the law, pretending that they are real judges. So now for the first time, the court actually, now there is a pending case. The first time there is a grand chamber case coming, the Court of Justice for the very first time in the history of EU law will have to decide whether Supreme Court judges in Poland are actually judges whose questions we can answer. This is what I mean by the auto autocratic authoritarian gangrenization of the EU, including EU judicial remedies. So the situation is bad. No wonder that uh, the president of the Court of Justice uh, said last week that the very survival of the EU project, the EU legal system is now at stake. Uh, if I could conclude with this, I would say uh, we need to move beyond denial. We need to move beyond uh, meaningless dialogue. We need to move beyond toothless reports. We need more condemnations. We need more enforcement and we need more sanction. Otherwise, uh, we will only help those threatening the EU's foundation as a union based on a number of values such as democracy, the rule of law and uh, fundamental rights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Laurent, for uh, setting the stage, laying out uh, the concept of backsliding and essentially reading from the authoritarian's handbook on how to do backsliding, which is a frightening read, uh, which may give you sleepless nights, not a book to be read in the evening. And your comments on the use responses, I think, are not really mitigating uh, these concerns, at least not for me. So thank you very much uh, for this sober analysis. Um, can I ask uh, Professor Dimitri Kochinov as the next speaker, who uh, uh, is uh, leading the rule of law work group at the Central European University's Democracy Institute and also teaches at the Department of Legal Studies with uh, a research interest and the research portfolio um, in the principles of law in the global context, uh, particularly on the rule of law on questions of citizenship and passports uh, and the enforcement of EU values with the great range of publications and books on uh, the topic that we are discussing, uh, including on the rule of law and democracy promotion by the EU in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, on the question of citizenship and inclusion and belonging to the European Union, um, books on the enforcement of EU law and value with uh, Oxford in 2017 and reinforcing rule of law oversight in the European Union with Cambridge in 2016. And if I understand correctly, they're working presently on a number of books, including one on the EU rule of law casebook, which I think is a joint endeavor between the two colleagues uh, here uh, joining this interest. Um, he used to be a professor in, in Groningen in the Netherlands before that with visiting appointments in Princeton, Oxford, NYU and a consultant to governments and international organizations and civil society in uh, the questions of rule of law enforcement. Uh, Professor Kochinov, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. What a delight to be here. It's, it's really a true honor to share the podium with Francesca and with Laurent. 
the, the old collaborators that were. And in fact, the draft of our casebook with Laurent, if I can use this to advertise it, is already there. And the, 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 the organizers promised to send the link to all those who registered. And also I sent them a box of the physical copies, but uh, I haven't seen them in the room somehow. So if they materialize, uh, you will receive a copy with, with thanks to SEPS, which is the Swedish Institute of International Affairs, I believe. But uh, let's let's go to the sad to the sad part of the story, and then finish with a uh, with, with an optimistic part, as as is my plan. So the the topic I picked for myself is the uh, is the uh, European Union's rule of law revolution, and this is something that uh, that draws directly on the story that uh, that Laurent Pesch uh, shared with us, but. Uh, takes a much longer, longer term perspective in, term, in terms of what the impact on the European Union will be of all the developments that, that we're facing today. Uh, but first, uh, I start with an apology. I will have to leave the conference uh, tonight because I have to take a night train to Vienna because unfortunately, uh, being a professor based in Hungary, I cannot teach in Hungary. Thank you very much. Uh, to the Orban regime, uh, so all our classes take place in, in neighboring Vienna, and uh, I, I'm delighted, of course, to teach there, but nothing wrong with Vienna, but I think it's a huge loss for the European Union that no forceful response from the European Commission has ever come in order to actually protect the seat of the Central European University, which is the best university in that region, uh, we were the best in uh, on, on all the rankings and in a number of disciplines in Hungary, just like we, we take the same places uh, in, 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 in Austria. But, uh, although the university won the case in front of the Court of Justice, uh, no result has materialized, in fact, in terms of an improving situation in, in, the, in, in the Hungarian context. And this is something that I will return to because, because it goes directly to the effectiveness of, of European, uh, European ways, supranational ways of dealing with, with the rot of the rule of law and with democratic backsliding. Plenty of uh, victors which are serialized on the editorials of all the main newspapers, in fact, don't mean, don't mean anything in practice on the ground because these victors, these victors turn out to be uh, quite pyrrhic victors. Uh, so I will, be, I will be going to Vienna, although I am officially I'm officially in Budapest. Then the general story that we're concerned with uh, was already predicted in a way 20, 30 years ago in the academic literature. Uh, when, uh, when Matthias Kuhn, when Joseph Weiler, uh, plenty of other colleagues wrote about the map, the mutual assured destruction between the courts uh, in, the, in, the, in the supranational versus national context. Of, uh, of European Union multi-level governance. So what, what does mutual destruction mean? Uh, if, if we turn to Raymond Aron, to, uh, to, to the classics of nuclear deterrent, deterrent literature, the idea is that you pile up so many, so many nuclear warheads that starting the war simply makes no sense. That's why it's mad to start the war and that's why uh, the better you are, uh, you're armed, the, 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 the more long lasting uh, peace will be. And this is, this is something that in a way applied to the relationship between the legal orders and between the courts belonging to different legal orders in the context of the European Union. Because of course, not following the court of justice is always a possibility. The court of justice doesn't enforce directly its own decision, decisions, the Court of Justice doesn't, doesn't have a separate system of local courts at the national level, but the costs of that can be overwhelming for the very survival of the legal system of, uh, of the European continent as we know it, with implications for, for, for Strasbourg as well, with implications for all the other member states too. And the, the belief was then that even if the dialogue between the courts in some member states and the, and, and the federal center of Europe, federal judicial center of Europe, which is on Kirchberg in Luxembourg, is not robust, this dialogue will not die out because precisely of the overwhelming costs of, uh, of this dying out of dialogue. And now what we, what we see coming from Poland is a radically new challenge, not only because there is, a, there is a direct confrontation between the self-proclaimed judges and, and uh, on the one hand and, and, and the EU judiciary on the other, but also because 
the dialogue is per se impossible with, the, with those who are fake, with those who cannot lawfully or in, in legal terms be treated as really belonging to, to the judiciary entitled to engage in any kind of meaningful discussions about the state of the law in the European Union at national or supranational level. And this is exactly the core of the problem, I believe. Uh, this is exactly how bad it has become. It is not really a conversation between, between equal member states on the one side and, uh, and, and, and the supranational authority on the other, between equal member states courts and, uh, and, and, and the supranational court. It is a conversation between those who pretend to be courts in a state that pretends to be a democracy, that pretends to be governed by the rule of law on the one side and the, and, and, and the forces of light, as it were, on the other. And this, in, in this context, it's particularly uh, disappointing to read plentiful commentary in the newspapers, including, including the FT, including the leading newspapers all around Europe, which actually forget this important, this important starting point. We have enough of case law from the Court of Justice, but also from the European Court of Human Rights, that, uh, that restates beyond any doubt that, that plentiful judges who actually pretend to be, uh, to be, taken, to, to be taking uh, really far-reaching decisions in the context of uh, judicial cooperation in Europe are not judges at all. And the same, and the same applies to the, to the latest decision of the so-called uh, constitutional, uh, constitutional Tribunal in Poland, which is not a lawfully composed tribunal as per, uh, as per the European Court of Human Rights, uh, which actually included on the panel the individuals who were expressly made in the case of the European Court of Human Rights as unlawfully appointed individuals. So there is a, it's, it's absolutely out of question uh, to call that body a real court and to call that decision a real decision if we are more or less true to, true, true to the facts of the story. And what we benefit from, of course, is that those facts are not only up to Poland to determine. Those facts are also up to the European, uh, European Councils of the Judiciary. Those facts are also up to the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights uh, to determine and verify. And in this sense, we have, we have all the possibility to form an unbiased, uh, an unbiased picture of what is going on. And that unbiased picture, unfortunately, is, is, is very somber. In this somber context, there is constant misunderstanding, which is in part uh, fueled by the Polish authorities themselves, that try to rebrand the destruction of the rule of law and the unlawful composition of their courts as a dialogue between their courts and, 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 and supranational courts of the European Union, which somehow goes about European values and the understanding of the principles of European law. This is absolutely not true. The dialogue is not there, the dialogue is not possible, and, and the values are not in question at all. What is in question is the existence of Poland as a rule of law based uh, multi party democracy. What is more troubling than Poland is Hungary, because there are different ways of attacking the rule of law. So you can, you can go all, all crazy and simply pretend that your own constitution, the, the, the European Convention of Human Rights, and, and the supranational legal order do not exist, all of them. And this is, and this is something that, that happened in Poland. Or you can modify everything very, very smoothly and slyly in such a way that, in fact, uh, you treat the other, the other legal orders as non-existent. And of course, uh, you would expect the two situations to be treated differently probably, but they are not. Well, they are probably by the Court of Justice, but they are not by the European Commission. So the silence and the failure to push back against what's going on applies equally, and uh, uh, Professor Fash will, will correct if he, if he disagrees, but I think it applies equally to Poland and to Hungary, to my deep regret, and to the deep regret of plenty of, uh, of my fellow professors who are teach in Vienna, and to the deep regret of plenty of, uh, plenty of citizens of both places who actually believe that part of the mission of the European Union is precisely to make sure that both levels of European governance, supranational and national, strictly follow the ideals of Article 2, which imply robust democracy, the rule of law, and the protection of human rights. 
So there is obviously a responsibility lying on the supervision level to make sure that the European Union makes its position known and that the European Union uses all the tools at, at its disposal in order to push back against, the, against what is going on in Poland and Hungary. So far, and this is what, the, what our case book also demonstrates, the, the Court of Justice has been unfortunately probably the only institution in the whole European legal space, if we speak about the European Union, uh, that spoke against, against the rough uh, democratic and rule of law backsliding that is ongoing. The second such institution is the European Court of Human Rights. So unfortunately, the whole, the whole problem is, uh, is only visible to the judiciary. Well, it's visible to all, but only the judiciary actually sees the problem and tries to deal with it. What are the causes of it? And I think I, I will be slightly provocative here, but I think the causes of, of this situation go directly to the design of the European Union itself and to design of uh, its approaches to, uh, to enlarging itself. So what is, what is the essence of the rule of law of the European Union? If we look at the classical literature, uh, Mackenzie Stewart, uh, Professor Fernandez Esteban, uh, there, are, there are plenty of uh, plenty of excellent accounts up to uh, the, the paper that NYU published, uh, authored by Professor Pesh. The classical literature always starts with Miver. And Miver is the first case where the Court of Justice told us actually that the European communities uh, are based on the rule of law because, because every decision is bound by law, every decision is based, is, is based on law in our union. So that's the rule of law. And then we pretty much stay there. So what, what, does, this, uh, what does this definition of the rule of law as something, as, as all the law being based on law actually tell us? It tells us that Hungary is okay because the definition is absolutely circular. Because if you can be legalistic, if legality is observed, then you will meet the, the leader stand of the rule of law principle. So this is a very problematic approach to the rule of law. And this kind of problematic approach, obviously, obviously is absolutely clear. Uh, when once we, once we look at what, what, what is happening in Hungary on the ground, you can reform the state in such a way that it is not a democracy anymore to the, to the leading observers. And that it's uh, the, the, the independence of, of, of the highest uh, orders of the judiciary is in question to plentiful observers without actually violating the legal framework of, 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 the, of, that, of that constitutional system. This is absolutely possible. So you have two ways to, to destroy the rule of law. The lawful way and the unlawful way. And the true rule of law principle should necessarily capture both, not only one. The starting, the starting leader point of European law, defining the rule of law, could only capture one, but then the European Commission decided actually not to do anything about it. And especially the European Council and especially the Council and all the consultative, uh, consultative uh, uh, organs, uh, all, all those committees, et cetera, they have done nothing in order to, in order to improve the situation on the ground, uh, which, which actually concerns all the member states as, as Professor Pesh has demonstrated. And here I start with my positive story. So while it's absolutely, it's absolutely evident that Lever is trash rule of law, it's, it's an unacceptable starting point, and it cannot be workable, uh, the, the crisis in Hungary and Poland pushed the European Union in order to start profoundly rethinking the, the basic premises on which the legal system is built. And this is precisely, I think, the, the positive spillover of all the horrible stories that, uh, that, that we'll be telling each other uh, throughout the two days, almost two days of this conference. Uh, because for the first time, the very, the very essence of what the European Union stands for is being questioned. And then the Union has to react in such a way in order to re reinvent its, 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 uh, its starting pillars, its, uh, its, its foundational, foundational stones, as it were. So these crises are uh, long run to the better and we will all benefit from them. 
But in the short run, of course, the, 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 picture, is, uh, the picture is radically different. So let's, let's compare uh, the Lever rule of law with a limited legalistic uh, circular definition of the rule of law with any mature constitutional system anywhere in the world. Well, usually any constitutional system would stand, would stand for its substantive values. So you, 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 you think about laicite in France, you think about dignity in Germany, uh, every, every system has something to proclaim and something officially to die for. This is what constitutions are about. Now take the European Union with its, with its circular there and check against the key case law of the Court of Justice what the foundational principles are. I have, I have followed basic exercise for the European yearbook of, uh, for, for the yearbook of European law uh, several years ago. And no matter how carefully you read the case law, no fundamental conceptual moral starting point emerges. I dismiss the internal market as such. I'll try because you cannot, you cannot really limit someone's rights in the name of the market. You cannot, uh, you cannot dismiss someone as a full participant of a society in the name in the name of the market. Rather, the opposite should be true. So then, once we look at the actual principles of play, there is one that emerges as a con convincing candidate for what the union stands for, and that is the supremacy of its own law. And if the supremacy of its own law is a core principle, then we face a problem because you can, up, you can come up with all kinds of rubbish, calling it national constitutional identity, calling it, uh, calling it uh, uh, thousand, thousand year old ways of, of the law of the crown or whatever, it's up to you. Uh, pick Hungary, pick Poland, pick any other member state. And of course, substance is likely to be more appealing than, than procedure because supremacy is, is, is ultimately perceived. So what is going on now uh, after the Portuguese judges ruling, which has already been mentioned, the European Union for the first time is feeding us or explaining to us through the mouth of the, of the Court of Justice and the president of the Court of Justice especially, the substance of the rule of law. And that substance of the rule of law previously unheard of going beyond supremacy presumably is connected with, uh, with the idea of the judicial, of judicial independence and uh, impartial tribunals that, uh, that have to be in place in all the member states and also at the supranational level. And the, this, it's easy to, to root that in the treaties. It's very easy to, to find traces of that everywhere we look from the European, from the European Convention of Human Rights uh, to, the, to the Charter of Fundamental Rights, to the treaties themselves. That's why Article 19 is, is so profoundly usable in this context. That's why the, 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 the case was so appealing. And to me, this is, a, this is really a, a revolution in the self-understanding of the European Union. Because the circularism, uh, the circular logic of Liber is being replaced by a substantive understanding of the values of Article 2. And then Article 19 is used in order to, in order to give the European Court of Justice a possibility to step in, in order to protect that substance. And then, uh, then on top of that, we'll, as, as a cherry, we also have uh, the ways to enforce uh, the, the, the proclamations of substantive values if the member states fail to comply. And this is something that we've seen even over the last weeks when Poland was, was asked to pay, uh, if, in one case it was a million, another one, in another case it was half a million euros per day for uh, precisely the bridges that directly connect the majority of them uh, to, the, to the newly found substance of the rule of law at the supranational level. And of course, if we look at, the, at those amounts and compare them with what Poland receives annually from the European Union, only these years transfers from the European Union to Warsaw uh, will be enough to cover all fines for the coming 38 years. One colleague from Leiden counted that and shared on Twitter. So it's obvious that these fines are meaningless if you really expect them to, uh, to change the regime in Poland. Uh, we know from political science literatures that regime change is extremely costly. So uh, 
thousands of times higher fines will be necessary in order to push for to push Poland off the course. But then again, you need to start somewhere. And what interests me now, and what I think is overwhelmingly relevant for us in all the member states from Austria and Italy to, uh, to the Netherlands Island, is that the union is not the same anymore. Since the union cannot anymore trust the member states to, to stick to the promise of, of the values which are shared between the two, uh, between the two legal orders, the union started coming up with its own substance and it started enforcing that, sub that substance against the member states that, uh, that, that go astray. So to me, this is, a, this is a true revolution. Unfortunately, this revolution, I would have preferred living without a revolution like that, uh, but it's better to have the substance in place because it makes the union a more trustworthy constitutional system as such. It's not anymore simply a proclamation. It's, it, the union is something that, that is starting to emerge as, as a real trustworthy uh, constitutional system of rule of law based law, which is actually comparable to what we see at the, national, at, at the member states uh, level today. So this was my very simple story. And uh, I hope uh, that by connecting, by connecting what I, I told you with, uh, with what Laurent uh, shared with all of us, uh, you can have a slightly more optimistic picture. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dimitri. Thank you very much for dissecting the notion of rule of law for us and for putting it in the broader context of uh, the changed self-perception and self-understanding of the EU, I think, which is a theme very much echoing what Laurent has said before, that this is not the union uh, we're used to. This is a different uh, stage, a different moment, a different movement, and that is why it's so important to discuss this. Uh, which takes me to the third speaker of this morning, uh, which I can see already on the screen. Welcome, uh, uh, Francesca Zumia. Dr. Francesca Zumia is a senior lecturer joining us from the School of Law at the University of Sheffield. Uh, she has received her training in, in Torino and in, in, in Harvard Law School uh, and used to work at the University of Torino as a, as a research fellow. Uh, she's also a practicing lawyer in, in Italy and in New York. Uh, and her interest, uh, research interest, lies essentially at the intersection of EU free movement law, uh, questions of citizenship and citizenship theory, and comparative immigration law. Um, with a view towards the position of the European Union, uh, as well as uh, the larger question of supranational citizenship, uh, on which she has uh, published uh, a book on supranational citizenship and the challenge of diversity, immigrants, citizens, and member states in the European Union. Uh, and she's going to talk to us on reframing the cosmopolitanism of EU values, the argument from within. Uh, Francesca, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gerd, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you can, you can hear me well. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for, for inviting me to participate in this um, very inspirational conference, and I truly regret not being able to be there in person, um, which is due precisely to uh, the, the system of free movement in a way, as right now I, I don't have a passport in my hands because my, my passport is with the British authorities who are supposed to issue me with the British passport together with my Italian one. So in the glitches of, of cross-border interactions, uh, I wasn't able to travel and to join you in person, unfortunately, but I am very much in, in that beautiful room that I can see from, from here uh, in spirit. Um, so, I've been asked to, to contribute to frame the discussion on an inclusive governance of fundamental value. And uh, my colleagues, Laurent and, and Dimitri, have already set the stage uh, on the rule of law. Um, there is, I, I see in the program for the conference, uh, an extremely rich lineup of interventions um, that promises to address uh, the question of fundamental values from a rich tapestry of perspectives, even beyond the rule of law. So what fundamental values? The rule of law, of course, but also non-discrimination, privacy, the rights of migrants, health status, how threatened by the pandemic, um, by artificial intelligence, 
by exclusionary dynamics. Uh, and whose responsibility? The European Union as an external actor, the European Court of Human Rights, the national courts. So my objective here is to take um, one step back, maybe, and to address um, a meta question, if you want. Uh, so what are, and the meta question is, what are the shared commitments that underpin our attempt to frame an inclusive governance of fundamental values? Um, what is that something to die for, in, in the words of Dimitri, and, and, and I don't want to suggest this is something to die for, but maybe something at least to live towards. Um, and the argument I want to bring um, is an argument about rethinking the cosmopolitan credentials of EU fundamental values. To do that, um, I want to start from a historical episode and a news item in the last few days here in the UK um, that's sharing one aspect. They are both remarkable for their irrelevance, so I'm not claiming that they bring anything of substance to the table, but they have a highly symbolic content in terms of two non-values um, that I see the project of European integration as responding to. So the historical episode is recounted by Edward Weir in the journal of his travels um, in southern Italy. Edward Lear, for those of you who are not familiar with his name, um, was a British uh, author and painter of the 19th century, uh, renowned among others for his illustrations of children's books, and uh, also an early day globetrotter, somebody who really liked to travel, particularly around the Italian peninsula in search of subjects. And um, the episode I'm referring to takes place uh, somewhat farther south than when you are uh, where you're sitting today uh, in Calabria on the tip of the Italian boot. And the year is 1847. So we are on the eve of the Italian Risorgimento and there is a certain atmosphere of insecurity in the air in both domestic and international relations that perhaps resembles to some extent what we are experiencing today. So Edward Lear, um, on the evening of August 13th of 1847, arrives with the locally hired muleteer to Rocella, um, a beautiful rocky cape on the Ionian coast of Calabria. And as is the custom of the day, he has a letter of introduction released by a notable family in the previous town he has visited, Gerace, uh, introducing him to the local notable family in um, Rocella. So that's, that's uh, uh, the ancestor of the passport, so to say. And uh, so he's, um, he goes to knock on the door of the family of Don Giovanni Nanni in Rocella, where he's welcomed most hospitably, as he recounts, and treated to a dinner of fruits and vegetables only. Fruits and vegetables that are offered to him, as he tells in, in his journal, as to an unlucky vagabond coming from a distant land where no fruits and vegetables can exist. This is the firm belief of his host family. And Edward Lear protests that there are fruits in England. There are fruits not only, there are fruits that you do not know at all, currants, gooseberries, green gauges. But as he um, admits, his, his claims are um, welcome with thinly hidden incredulity. Gooseberries, green gauge, che cosa sono queste cose, replied the host. These things do not exist, they are but dreams. And so Edward Lear ends up eating his dinner quietly, almost convinced that he is indeed an impostor and has been lying. So, Admittedly parodistic, this, this episode uh, refers to uh, some ideas of incredulity and, and stereotyping that symbolize two fundamental non-values to which the European integration project has harbored a response. And these two non-values are um, mistrust and othering. Uh, two non-values I've been reminded of, uh, and I come to the second item, um, the news item in, in the UK, um, I'm not sure how much of the headlines in the UK make it to the continent these days. I'm sure you read about the, the dispute on the fisheries and, and, and this stuff. This particular news item is, as I said at the beginning, absolutely irrelevant. But it is about a popular supermarket chain in the UK, Morrison's. 
And Morrison's apparently, um, a few weeks ago, put on its shelves a package of ready to eat chicken with a prominent label on the front um, saying made with British chicken, Union Jack to follow, and non-EU, non-European Union salt and pepper. So basically, um, mistrust, which is at the basis of uh, European rules on the indication of uh, the origin of ingredients that still apply in the UK as retained law, turned into a form of ordering as a marketing message. Again, mistrust and ordering. So how has the European Union project responded to mistrust and ordering? Through two fundamental commitments, mutual recognition and a sort of principle of cosmopolitanism, as I want to call it today. And so in the remainder of my time, I want to do three things. Um, I want to map the relation between the principle of mutual recognition and this idea of cosmopolitanism as an ordering in EU law. Uh, I want to argue that we can interpret the crisis of values of which the rule of law is an expression, but not the sole expression, as a crisis of cosmopolitanism, at least in part. And then I want to offer some thoughts on how we can rethink the cosmopolitan credentials of EU fundamental values. Um, so let me start from the first point then, uh, the principle of mutual recognition. As the court has um, reaffirmed um, at, at last in, in uh, some recent European arrest warrant cases, mutual recognition is a principle fundamental to EU law, not necessarily a fundamental principle in the jargon of the court, but a principle fundamental to EU law. A uh, principle that itself build, builds on the fundamental principle of mutual trust. And we see it exemplified in a number of areas of EU law. Uh, the law on free movement of goods, of course, in criminal law in the context of um, the, the system of extradition based on the European arrest warrant. Um, as I have argued in, in my research, uh, going one step further, mutual recognition is at the very basis of the notion of supranational citizenship in the European Union. So you can see supranational citizenship is based on a norm of mutual recognition among the national citizenships of the member states. Norm of mutual recognition operationalized in part although not exclusively, through the legal rule of non-discrimination on the basis of nationality. But there is more to mutual recognition. I argue that mutual recognition embodies um, the cosmopolitan nature of, of European integration. How? Because through recognition, and here I borrow the words of uh, the philosopher Paul Ricoeur, um, the gap between the idea of the, of the one and the idea of the other is suddenly narrowed. So mutual recognition is at the basis of this idea of no othering, of treating the other to some extent as one of us. It was one of the um, foundational inspirations of, uh, of the project of integration in the thinking, for instance, of Joseph Weiler. But it has been recuperated in, in recent years um, in, uh, in the writing of uh, some of, of the thinkers on European integration that has, have proposed the cosmopolitan status reading uh, of, of the role of the European Union. I'm thinking of Richard Bellamy and his idea of the European Union as a Republican Association of Sovereign States and Calypso Nicolaidis and uh, her idea of a democracy. Um, but of course, this idea of no ordering is that this cosmopolitan idea at the basis of the project of integration uh, has emerged battered uh, from the crisis of the last decade, from the financial crisis to the migrant crisis, um, to the rule of law crisis, and even now the pandemic. And so I come to my second point. There is a way to interpret the current crisis of values in the European Union as at least in part a crisis of cosmopolitanism, by which I mean a crisis in this imperative of no othering. Um, the crisis of values is often seen as a crisis of trust, as a crisis of mutual trust, and that there's no denying that. Um, but it is also 
a crisis of no ordering. So ordering is at its height uh, in, in the European Union and in its member states. We see it through the north-south dynamics that have emerged from the financial crisis, um, the closure to external migrants in, in the context of border control policies, the very withdrawal of the United Kingdom from the European Union as part of a strategy to regain control at internal borders and uh, repress uh, internal migrants, among others. The denouncing of foreign institutions, foreign academic institutions, transnational institutions in uh, the countries that are under populist capture, such as Poland and ha Hungary. Not least the closure, the very closure of borders in the context of the pandemic. So this is a crisis of cosmopolitanism that reinforces um, the crisis of trust that is exemplified uh, by, by, that is triggered and exemplified by the rule of law breakdown. Um, and in the wake of this crisis, denial of recognition replaces mutual recognition as a key norm throughout the European Union. So we have the tendency to deny recognition in the dialogue among the courts, as we saw last year with the judgment of the Bundesverfassung Gericht in the uh, PSPP case. Um, in the context of the Polish government, it's very denial of, of, of the shared institution. The denial of the public health systems of other member states and their function in the context of the pandemic. My quarantine, my travel test, my travel ban, rather than relying on your own system of response to the pandemic. Um, if you want, even denial of recognition emerging as a possible new approach to European arrest warrants in the wake up of the uh, Aragnosi case law and its recent interpretation in the context of the Polish crisis. So this is a crisis of no ordering, and I want to be clear here, that begins from the state, from the member states of the European Union, not from the European Union per se. It is a crisis in the cosmopolitan role of the state. What is the cosmopolitan role of the state? It is somewhat counterintuitive. There is um, a lot of attention in the recent literature on cosmopolitanism on uh, how to think of the cosmopolitan role of the state. Let's say to simplify that being cosmopolitan uh, on the part of the state requires complying with a moral norm, equal concern for individuals regardless of their jurisdiction and national um, territorial belonging, and uh, an institutional norm, an institutional norm of impartiality. So again, to simplify, um, we can think of the cosmopolitan role of the state as having to do with navigating with a degree of openness the tension between um, according preferential treatment to the citizens as per the social contract and treating others, treating the non-citizens, treating the persons beyond the state's jurisdiction according to uh, a rule of equal concern. If, is, if this is a crisis of cosmopolitanism for the state, for the EU, this is a crisis of disempowerment, inadequacy, uh, inability to trigger this cosmopolitan role of the state. And so part of our effort at thinking um, uh, about uh, a shared system of governance of, of fundamental values, an inclusive system of governance, has to do, I argue, with rethinking how can the EU um, trigger, encourage, support the cosmopolitan role of the state. And here, if we go through the usual channels, we are somewhat out of fuel. The neo-Kantian idea of uh, hospitality and its implications in the context of the norm of non-discrimination, the principle of no harm uh, that Andrew Linklater has advocated and its humanitarian implications, the idea of other regardingness and its human rights implications. Um, all of these are somewhat tired in, in the European political arena, um, where the European state is reluctant to own these values and this commitment in the face of competing ones, the sovereign state, the people, the citizens, the national coffer of values. All those things that, at least from the perspective of the sovereignists and the nationalists, cosmopolitanism disdains with an arrogant attitude as non-universal attachments. So how do we re-engage the European national state? Um, 
And I want to suggest that we have to momentarily divorce recognition from cosmopolitanism and try to nest the norm of recognition, which is at the basis of the European project, within that very set of values, the state, the people, uh, the, the national values, to then return to cosmopolitanism from within. And I come to my third and last point. So how can we rethink the cosmopolitan credentials of European values? And here, I just want to put on the table a couple of thoughts. Um, by no means, uh, I, I can by no means offer any ready package solution like Morrison's chicken. Um, it's really a couple of ideas that hopefully can surface and sink in the discussion today, this afternoon, and, and tomorrow, and hopefully help to frame uh, the debate. So the first point is that we always think of mutual recognition from an inward looking perspective. And this is also the perspective that is predominant in the literature of mutual recognition in the European Union. So inward looking in the sense that mutual recognition um, compels the state to recognize the, rec the, the regulation, for instance, of goods of another member state, the judicial system of another member state for purposes of executing a European arrest warrant. Uh, even more importantly, it compels the state to recognize nationals of other member states as part of its own community to some extent. And this inward looking mutual recognition is the kind of recognition that in uh, an era of nationalist and sovereignist revivals um, triggers a sense of, um, of burden on the part of the state and a sense of sovereign disempowerment. However, there is also an outward looking side of the norm of recognition that is often disregarded. And it has to do with um, the way from the perspective of the sending state, uh, mutual recognition means that the national regulation uh, reaches beyond national borders. The judicial system of the member state um, influences also uh, the citizens of other member states, again, reaches beyond the territorial borders. More generally, um, the very relation between the state and the citizen as sanctioned in the social contract is no longer exclusive. The state and the citizen mutually recognize that the citizen belongs beyond national borders. And this outward looking aspect of the norm of mutual recognition um, grounds uh, an imperative of no ordering from within, or in other words, a norm of cosmopolitanism from within the state. Through engaging with the other uh, beyond the national boundaries, beyond the territorial boundaries, um, the state fulfills the very promise to the citizen, even to the ordinary person citizen that is at the center of the populist narrative. Um, and relatedly, outward looking recognition coupled with uh, this, this norm of no ordering from within um, replaces the narrative of the state as under ransom from the process of integration with a narrative of the state as empowered through integration and through participation in uh, the system of common values of the European Union. So how can this narrative help our discussion today and tomorrow and more broadly how we're thinking about the common values? It offers a perspective, a way of thinking, another pair of grasses to borrow the, the words of Professor Salviulo earlier today. Um, so a perspective that we can apply to give you some, some concrete examples to the debate on the rule of law, for instance. So in thinking about the rule of law um, as, as a common value, uh, we now have two uh, tensions in the history of European integration, two different tensions. One between, in the dialogue between the national courts and the court of justice uh, in, in the history of integration, but also in recent years, up to last year, on how to protect the national rule of law, the national constitutional value from EU level erosion. And now we have the other perspective, how to protect a European mediated rule of law from uh, national erosion. So, the idea of cosmopolitanism from within and, and of the re-empowerment of the state through transnational engagement suggests to think how to bolster the state capacity to protect the rule of law through EU law as a way to frame the question. 
Similarly, on human rights, uh, it invites to think of human rights in two ways. The human rights of our citizens, because they are citizens of a broader collective, and the human rights of others, not only because they are persons, but also because, if, if you want, in a perspective of constitutional selfishness, they are also an insurance policy for our citizens. And democracy, an understanding of democracy, to borrow the words of Neil Walker, that is vigilant at all times to reconcile interests within and beyond the demos. Um, and this is not just out of the imperative of other regardedness, but it is to fulfill the very democratic promise of uh, the social contract. So in what way can this narrative be deployed? Um, as a rational for the courts, national courts and transnational courts alike in interpreting the provisions that embody EU values, as a vocabulary of political dialogue, as a grammar of governance. Ultimately, um, rethinking the cosmopolitan credentials of European values from within engages the resistance to the European Union from the sovereignist and nationalist side on its very terrain, citizens first. Um, but it does to this slogan the same that Morrison has done to his chicken. Take the negative warning. Beware, there is non-European Union salt and pepper in this chicken, so it may be dangerous for health and turn it into a marketing slogan. This is non-European Union stuff. This is precisely why you should buy it. There, there is value in it. Take the nationalist slogan, citizens first, so let's keep the others out, and turn it into a principle of transnational engagement. Citizens first, that's precisely why you should think of the other and think of a shared governance of fundamental values. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Francesca, for framing uh, the topic in, in a broader sense, for reminding us of the way we construct values, but as you said, also construct non-values, which I think is an interesting debate in the way in which uh, liberal, illiberal democracies are both considered just values uh, on, on the same level, and also for coming, uh, framing it in, in the cosmopolitan debate and reconstructing the union as a cosmopolitan enterprise. We seem to need these reminders. We also needed the reminder by Dimitri that there is a thing called primacy of EU law, uh, that there is sort of, this is, this is the state of debate that we seem to, seem to have. And also I think your, your chicken example is, is well, because what we are discussing is, is situated in the broader sense of the fallout of the Brexit, of the legacy of austerity, of a pandemic which we find ourselves in. So these are not isolated events, I think, when it comes to the debate that we have here. Thank you very much to all three of you. This opens the floor for uh, questions and discussion. I would suggest that we collect perhaps a few questions um, starting here in the room. Uh, if there are any questions, then, and then try to move, to move online and to integrate our online participants. Uh, again, please, if you have a question, identify yourself and then please use this microphone so that uh, the online participants can also hear you. Um, questions, comments, critique in this room. Dimitri is the first in response to the other panelists. Someone has to start. So uh, I, I have a couple of questions to Francesca, in fact. Uh, we, don't, we don't see her face anymore. But I, I found the, the intervention really, really thought-provoking because my starting point of thinking about the European Union would be radically different. Uh, I view it as an anti-cosmopolitan project, uh, a wolf of anti-cosmopolitanism that, uh, that is wearing a sheepskin of uh, cosmopolitan rhetoric. And this in particular applies to EU citizenship, but also to other, uh, to other aspects of uh, European uh, European policy governance and uh, European functioning. And uh, in, 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 in my starting point, I would uh, draw on Andrew Williams's work, especially on EU values, the Oxford Journal of the Studies, his book on, uh, on the ethos of Europe, which I, which I very much enjoyed. So EU citizenship is the, and, and the European legal space 
is the only constitutional system in the world by definition excludes the foreigner on the basis of nationality only. So discrimination on the basis of nationality is guaranteed omnipresent and sanctified in the European Union legal space. Why? Because EU law only applies to EU citizens because the, the, the non-existence of the inter-European uh, inter borders only applies to those who have a particular legal status. In this sense, uh, Americans, the Brits, the Indians, the Russians, whoever, treat the foreigner by definition overwhelmingly better than Europeans. So if Europeans do that, uh, if they're in crisis, could it be precisely the crisis of anti-cosmopolitanism? The, the constant tension that you, that you experience between spitting on the foreigner by law at the constitutional, most sacred level, compared with how you treat your own. And now the Brexit, of course, will lead the UK to, to the, the UK citizens uh, to the discovery of what it means to be a foreigner in an anti-cosmopolitan, antagonistic, and pre-post-national uh, pre legal system, which is the European Union. So in this sense, the European Union uh, are the futile attempts to replicate the nationalist state of the 19th century, which I think, uh, which I think we should always applaud uh, when, they, when they fail. Not the failing union, but the failing uh, idea of uh, the cosmopolitan union in this uh, fake sense of the word. Jessica, would you want to, to respond in any way? Sure. Thank you, Dimitri. I was I was expecting this coming from you, and um, um, well, the EU is an entire cosmopolitan project. I think um, those are different pairs of glasses that we can wear on um, on a common problem. So there is at the basis of European citizenship and of the project of integration, there is a norm of no ordering. But you can see that norm of the on no ordering adds. Um, re, uh, recasting the texture of the boundary between the us and the them, or just shifting the boundary, which is what you are describing. And indeed, this is the very narrow edge that cosmopolitanism, the European way, as I see it, has always navigated. So um, are we just shifting the boundary? So are we just um, upgrading to privileged internal treatment our own common citizens at the expense of the others? Or are we using common citizenship as a new concept, um, as a new concept that invites us to rethink national citizenship and its value in a way that it has to open up to uh, the non-national and the others as well? Um, and I want to argue that there are signs of the latter in, in the role of European citizenship, but without, of course, arguing that the project has been um, successful in this respect. As, as I was saying in my talk, what we're witnessing right now is precisely um, a crisis of uh, ordering, ordering at its height. But what I think tends to get lost in, in, in the discourse and in the interpretation is that this is a crisis of the cosmopolitan role of the state. So uh, it is a matter, it, it is an instance of cosmopolitan backsliding on the part of the national state. So the EU has lost uh, its, um, uh, its, its sheep, so to say. Uh, in, uh, in, in the process. And this is precisely um, what forces us to rethink where are the cosmopolitan credentials of the project. And I think there is, there is a negative narrative, which is the one that you point to, Dimitri. So European citizenship uh, sanctions the role of the EU in treating the other worse than in any other national state, because we even emphasize this boundary between the internal order and the external order, and we create a three-party distinction between the citizen, uh, the not-so-order, and the terribly order, so to say. Uh, that's the negative narrative. There is a counter-narrative. Uh, that traverses European citizenship, uh, its legal interpretation, its political meaning, um, which is precisely rethinking the transnational credentials of national citizenship. And this is where the narrative has been interrupted, I think, and where it needs to be um, unraveled and continued. So 
if we think of the forward looking implications of that narrative. Um, so, how opening up citizenship to the norm of non discrimination implies that citizenship reaches beyond the national boundaries. These uh, grounds a norm of recognition of the other, a powerful norm of recognition of the other, which benefits in addition from all the traditional, so, uh, allow me the word, imperatives of cosmopolitanism, hospitality, no othering, um, other regardingness, no harm. It benefits from the very selfish perspective of citizenship. And this is where the project of integration, as I see it, is potentially placed to go much farther than any other national state and any national state actually say no other national state in in achieving uh, a real system of northern not to say that we are there to say in an optimistic perspective that maybe we can get there thank you other questions there is one question would you be able to come to the mic It's for the online for the for the online participants so that they can hear uh, the comment being made. Okay. All right. So my question is, uh, I'm always focused on what um, individuals can do. So I'm listening to this. Of course, I'm appalled by these uh, developments, but. Uh, what do I do? So <laughs> um, uh, I, I think that uh, as regular citizens, we feel far removed from these kinds of issues because they sound quite elitist. A lot of us don't understand the language being used, the diction being used. Um, I'm lucky I'm in the university space, but if I was just someone off the street, how would you communicate this issue? And then how can, how can I, as a person off the street, take what you've told me and find a way to uh, vote better or to uh, communicate it to my, my, my network and then ask them to do something about this. And what do they do? Yes. Thank you. Anyone wishing to take up this not easy question? I mean, that's, the, that's a good question and that, that's a usual question. Um, Obviously, uh, or to communicate uh, or to explain the process of democratic and rule of law backsliding, you have to adjust it uh, depending on the audience. If you were to invite me to uh, a secondary school, I would not obviously uh, address the issue in the same scholarly way. Um, so what can you do? Um, and in terms of communicating what's happening, actually, a lot of good work is already done uh, by many organizations. Um, I'm thinking about uh, Poland, where uh, the Polish judges, lawyers, Polish NGOs uh, have produced a one-minute video. Why should we care about the rule of law? What does it mean for me? It's actually not that difficult to explain if you uh, uh, adopt a kind of a, what happens when you don't have the rule of law, what happens when you don't have a democracy, what concrete impacts it's going to have on you. Uh, communicating to those uh, who actually live in those countries is actually very easy because they are experiencing uh, the consequences, the practical consequences quite clearly uh, on themselves. Uh, as academics, talking to academics, uh, I mean, I have mentioned uh, the example of Professor Sajowski being sued because he criticized the ruling party being an expert on constitutional issues. Now, if that doesn't speak to you, I don't know what else uh, can speak to you. Uh, university is also being targeted uh, in terms of uh, what the way they teach and the kind of uh, books they give to their students. I mean, again, I can multiply examples and examples. Threats are being made uh, to you through uh, a newly appointed dean. So that's the Hungarian also in Polish method. Just a personal example from a Polish friend of ours. Uh, he went to an international conference to speak on the rule of law. The, when he got back to his office on Monday, he got a call from his uh, from the rector. There, there's all, in Hungary and Poland, there's been some changes regarding the way universities are managed and say, well, you know, you shouldn't really speak about this kind of issues abroad. That's obviously uh, not uh, visible, not formal, but the chilling effect of such uh, phone calls uh, on a Monday morning when you back an international conference, obviously, 
uh, just a concrete example of how insidious uh, the process of democratic and rule of law backsliding can be. Now, in terms of what we can do, and this is possibly, uh, there is not one single answer, I would say. Um, I mean, first of all, uh, reading about it and then becoming more aware of what's happening and what might happen to you next. So that's always something relatively easy to do, even though uh, uh, as lawyers, in fact, uh, the situation now, uh, if you're just new to the, to the area of rule of law and democratic backsliding, there is so much, in fact, to read, uh, legally speaking, for instance. It's very difficult to make sense of the rule of law situation in Poland if you haven't been following the situation from the start. I mean, I can try to explain it to you. Uh, but really, the destruction of the rule of law in Poland has been so massive, uh, multidimensional. Now, it's difficult. There's, there's been so many crimes committed against the rule of law judges that factual, just a factual explanation would take hours. But lucky us, there are some documents explaining uh, in, uh, the situation. Um, what can you, but uh, moving beyond uh, law, the, the area of law, can you do as a student or as a citizen? First of all, I would say, well, uh, perhaps uh, join a political party, join a civil society group. Uh, there are many uh, rule of law uh, uh, based organizations, even uh, uh, the bar association sometimes. I mean, the, the international bar association as a student association. Nothing preventing you from organizing uh, kind of a student-led uh, conference or inviting Polish judges or Hungarian lawyers to come to Padova and tell us or inviting uh, students from the CEU. I think uh, the more you also relay your solidarity, the better. Um, so I would say as a citizen, well, you can join your party, but you can also become an activist. Uh, also, if you don't want to do anything, but, and then you have extra resources, why don't you give uh, funding to those actually fighting in the trenches? Uh, association of judges, association of lawyers, uh, or civil society groups, uh, they're always uh, very short on uh, funding, whereas those destroying the rule of law have actually the state resources, including EU funding, which they can uh, misuse on an industrial scale. If you look at the situation uh, from, uh, at, in Hungary regarding university and uh, who is getting uh, funding from the state, then you realize the challenge uh, we're facing to maintain independent research centers or independent academic freedom. You are going against uh, this, an entire state structure, which is using not only national, but also European taxpayers, first of all, to deny there is anything wrong, and two, to harass you if you say there's something wrong. I think Dimitri was telling you about the sea, but I think most people have already forgotten. The first university expelled from a country in Europe since a Nazi in Norway. It's as if it has not happened. I mean, the commission did win in Luxembourg, has it made much of a difference? Uh, just a disclosure, I'm a member of the CU Democracy Institute myself, but Dimitri. So we kind of the 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 last uh, resisting pocket in a country where essentially all universities have been captured through different means, legal and informal means. And anyone who's not essentially kind of working in a relatively isolated institution like ours, then is at the mercy of really significant professional damages if you speak up. So a lot needs to be done in a different capacity. Uh, and I would say, so I've just given you some examples, but then I can multiply examples in terms of what uh, academics can do, judges in Italy, lawyers in Italy, but also parliamentarians in Italy. I think this is really, it's no longer really a purely uh, national phenomenon. Uh, the EU's interconnecting legal system, the destruction of rule of law in any member state is bound to produce uh, not only impacts uh, slowly but surely uh, in the rest of the EU. That's why I mentioned the idea of uh, authoritarian gangrene. I think this is, I mean, I just wanted to use a very strong image so that people wake up to the dangers of what's happening. Uh, this is spreading. Uh, the vote, the autocratic vote is spreading. And it's been 10 years in the making. But remember, for president of the European Court of Justice to say that the very survival of the EU legal system is at stake, he must have taken a lot for him to speak up in such clear terms when it is usually so soft-spoken. It's very unusual for presidents of international or European courts to be so bleak in their assessment. So at this stage, sadly, I'm afraid the situation is going to get worse in the short term. Um, 
And uh, the worst which could happen is possibly that uh, we continue to live in denial and then we pretend it's not happening. So then slowly but surely we're getting used to the idea that the EU is no longer a type of democracy, but we have semi-dictatorial regimes at the borders. And then we have learned to live with this and we've learned to live to forget that our EU rights and obligations are defined in part by authoritarian authorities, uh, which are to consolidate the autocratic regimes also stealing from us, but uh, since, uh, they are decided to, since they have become stable regimes, then we can just look the other way. Uh, sorry for being almost as bleaker than President Lenas. Uh, I have used also the expression of uh, the analogy of the rule of, the rule of law houses on fire. This is what's happening. And this is why sometimes I get a bit frustrated, if not angry, when I hear that uh, the solution is more dialogue and more reports. It's as if people haven't been paying attention for the past 10 years. Dialogue and reports, I mean, as we've written with Dimitri, actually, can only work if you're dealing with good faith actors, not people trying to burn down the house while actually stealing from your pockets. Yeah, it's like, are you going to engage in a dialogue with an arsonist with a bunch of matches in his hands? I mean, it makes no sense whatsoever. And yet, uh, this is what we've been doing uh, for the past uh, 10 years, so much so that another concept which we haven't mentioned, but possibly worth discussing at the later stage. These authoritarian regimes are not simply authoritarian regimes. They can also be described as quasi-mafia state structures. Uh, so uh, in the case of Hungary, I think the concept of mafia state is also quite... Uh, Important. In fact, that's uh, it. Comes from uh, it comes from a sociologist. Uh, I think once you get uh, this concept into your framework of analysis, then you can actually go beyond simply the process of rule of law and democratic backsliding to and to then start thinking about uh, another concept in this context is uh, state capture. Uh, so mafia state, aka state capture. But this is the case in Hungary. But we haven't mentioned uh, Bulgaria. But same, uh, except uh, that uh, they have adopted a, a less antagonistic expansionist uh, uh, model of influence, which is why we speak less of it. Uh, but yes, the situation is uh, dire, and I would say everyone needs to wake up and try to do something. So. Thank you. Yes, thank you also for relating it back to academia, uh, because academic freedom is, is, as you said, part and parcel of this uh, problematic situation. So this is not a problem of someone, this is the problem of us, our problem. Other questions? Sorry, was there a question before? Can we have can we have the, the lady before and then and then one in the back? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. It was really interesting. Um, I have two. There are not question. One is uh, uh, to Francesca. I do agree with. Uh, Dimitri, that the, I would say that the EU has an anti cosmopolitan nation and it's the EU citizenship that demonstrate this because even if it is the first citizenship that break the necessary link between nationality and citizenship at the same moment in which it declares to destroy, let's say this necessary link um, rendering it a contingent link in the same moment it constructs the non-EU citizens. So I think it's really either we, and I would agree with Francesca, think about at its 30th anniversary, 2022, reform of the EU citizenship. And then we could talk and propose a cosmopolitan nature of EU, or we have to accept that EU has not at its founding values a cosmopolitan attitude, nor the states, I would say. I really see a contradiction in terms of talking about a cosmopolitan attitude of the states. To Dimitri, um, so I mean, this is, I, I, this is my, I don't know, uh, comment on your uh, interesting um, um, uh, paper. Uh, to Dimitri, I have a question. You talk about a revolution of the self-understanding of you since finally they discover there is a substantive um, uh, 
form of the rule of law. We know, we know a formal rule of law and also stamping rule of law. A formal rule of law is based on the control of procedures. So all this year would have been spent looking only to procedures, while the revolution would be that finally they discovered that rule of law as a substantive version. But then you quoted at the two um, level in which this revolution is uh, to be seen. And it's uh, uh, to look, she start, you started to look to judicial independence in partial tribunal, right? And, uh, and this is my question. Are we sure that it's a revolution? Because both these things are, could have been seen before as a violation of the procedures, no need to talk about the substantive value of the rule of law. So this is my question. Are we sure that we are in front of something that is not a revolution, but it's political? They say that now I'm looking at the substantial version of rule of law, while 10 years or more now, they didn't even look at the procedures because these are procedural aspects can be considered procedural aspect of the rule of law. So it's a revolution, but maybe we don't need to um, uh, talk about the substantive version of rule of law. Thank you. Thank you. I suggest we collect the two other questions and then answer them together. There was a gentleman on this side. Hi, I'm Ian Turner from, uh, from the UK. Um, it's really a comment rather than a question, but first of all, it's great to be back in the EU after COVID. It's the first time I've been back in the EU since Brexit. Um, it does feel like now that I'm actually transiting JK with the number of questions I have to enter before I get back in. So fingers crossed it won't be too long before I can use my biometric passport and get back into very much quicker than it is at the moment. Um, and also as well, we don't have a green pass, but that's, that's maybe one of the benefits for some people of not being in the EU anymore, but thankfully for still letting me in the bill without a green pass. Um, I was going to say as well, I'm a critical legal scholar, so I naturally um, have a critical view on the rule of law and principles that found the, rule, um, found the EU. Um, the rule of law itself is not traditionally served the best, the interests of women, people of colour, um, the working class, um, but also as well, I'd like to reference very briefly a critical legal scholar, Carl Schmidt. Now, Carl Schmidt, I have to preface Carl Schmidt because he's perhaps the last person to use at a conference on uh, human rights because Carl Schmidt himself, of course, joined the Nazi party in 1933. He did actually leave the Nazi party in 1936 because of threats to his life. He was um, arrested after World War II, was held in custody by the Nazis for a year, but was not put on trial at Nuremberg, and, but he refused attempts at denazification after World War II and, quote, remained mildly anti-Semitic. But what I would like to say is prior to 1933 and uh, joining of the Nazi party, it really follows on from what I really much enjoyed all the papers, but particularly Lauren's point about um, it's a burning building that obviously Hungary is an example um, to try, if, if we don't, if we just perhaps stay in our cushy liberal tolerance that we are conspiring in the demise of the EU and the EU project. So I use Schmidt as an example, but um, Schmidt himself in 1932 called for an unconstitutional interpretation of Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution we have to fight fire with fire, that this cosy liberal tolerance contributes to a suicide pact with the very defeat of constitutionalism. So my point is really uh, fidelity to rule of law and legality probably result in the very destruction of the EU if we continue on in the course that we're, we're, we're following. I'm not an EU lawyer, so apologies if I don't, I'm not familiar with the constitutions of the EU, but I'm just wondering maybe uh, the EU, it's EU process, it's EU law, um, it's obviously failure to censor Hungary, Poland, and of course, Laura mentioned Serbia as well. Is that actually part of the problem 
that um, they, may, they need to take much more dramatic, aggressive action that Laura mentioned, but maybe we also have to think outside the box, outside traditional principles of legality and constitutionalism to, for the very reason of saving the whole EU project. So an example would be, very briefly, uh, Amer um, Abraham Lincoln joined the American Civil War. Under the American Constitution, um, Congress can only um, can suspend habeas corpus. But during the American Civil War, Congress was not in session because it was an emergency. Lincoln, as the president, exercised that power of Congress. It was unconstitutional, but by, by the very nature, obviously uh, saved uh, the existing constitutional structure. So I'm not necessarily saying that we're at that system yet, that situation, the existential threat that um, Schmidt talks about in political theology. But I think Schmidt can give us some good idea about sort of the uh, non-legal, even extra-legal processes that we perhaps need to use as a way of survival of the very foundations that are built for post-World War II. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, and there was a third one on this side. Yes. Yeah, I'll just point to the one line there. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Anna, and uh, I'm here um, as a representative of Rotford University. And my question is uh, more related to what Professor Pech uh, has said. And um, reflecting the thesis that EU has some uh, double standards, and probably they are not going to take some uh, radical steps toward the exclusion, like Hungary and Poland, uh, from the EU in order not to create some precedents. Uh, do you think if there is an open uh, window of opportunities for the countries like Ukraine, Turkey, who have signed association um, and actually expecting to be a member of uh, European Union, uh, do you think this is a good chance for them to take this opportunity to push the EU, um, telling that their level of democracy is uh, higher than, for example, Hungary and Poland, and therefore to uh, force the EU somehow in this day? Thank you. Uh, let me give the chance to the panelists to respond, perhaps starting with Francesca, if there is anything you would wish to say uh, to the question, which was rather a comment. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, just very briefly, I guess um, um, citizen, European citizenship is anti-cosmopolitan. Um, let me clarify the way in which I argue it is cosmopolitan. So citizenship itself, national citizenship, has, has been defined as filing system. Okay. So the idea of citizenship is it files you to a state, you are the responsibility of that state. And that's the very anti cosmopolitan principle, right? State, a citizen, everyone else is external to that relation. European citizenship reverts that precisely through the norm of mutual recognition, non-discrimination on the basis of nationality, if you want. So the citizen is filed to you, but this doesn't mean you're not responsible for the other citizens. So it introduces a principle of shared responsibility for the citizens. And now it, there's an immediate fallout, which is um, how do you define the other? So if you simply enlarge the circle of the citizens, the citizens for, in whose respect there's mutual responsibility, then uh, you end up with an entire cosmopolitan project. But if you focus on that norm of recognition and its potential, and there are um, traces of these, in, among others, in the judicial interpretation of European citizenship, then um, there is a potential for the cosmopolitan project. And there's a second uh, thing I want to add, not specifically on the comment on citizenship, but on, on the role of the state and the role of the European Union. Um, as, as an actor and, and its double standards here. And I, and I absolutely second what Laurent is saying, that uh, um, there has to be action, there has to be sanctions in, in respect of the situation where, uh, where you have a rule of law breakdown. What I'm arguing for is, is sort of a double channel response here. One is a response um, uh, that goes through engaging the state through a narrative that brings the national state back to the project of integration. And this is one avenue that should run parallel to 
the sanctioning, the stopping, the intervening, the not accepting um, what is going on um, in, in Poland and Hungary, among others. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to start with the question which was asked in the in the in the, in the previous round, as it were. What can what can I do? And as a citizenship scholar, I can tell you, uh, in in a slight contrast with Laurent, that you can do nothing. You are nobody. You are nothing. You can never go against the state. You cannot go. You can never go against the union. The only way for you to achieve any kind of success, and I again agree with Laurent, is to is to participate in the institutions. So. Unless you join strong institutions, have built strong institutions, uh, finance strong institutions, you are nothing and your voice will never be heard. This is, this is the whole idea why, why citizenship, including your citizenship, is so good for governability of societies. As a citizen, you are meek and don't exist. Uh, but then what, becomes it, uh, what, what makes it more difficult in the European context is that if we were speaking about the context of the state, about the US, for instance, the federal government does nothing about, uh, about some horrible rights in a particular state, then you, uh, you throw scoundrels out. You say, this is not my president. This is not my country. This is not how I want the federal authorities to behave. Of course, it doesn't always work that way, as, 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 as we learned from Daniel Kellerman and other, other leading commentators, very often a federal, a federal system would actually harbor an autocratic uh, federal uh, entity within the federation uh, in order to feed a political power, political party in power at the, at the federal level, thereby get support for the destruction of democracy and rule of law. So in this sense, uh, Daniel Kellerman explains very well why Hungary was very beneficial for the EP and for the German government. And this is the explanation for use in action. The, but then pu pushing it a little bit further, the throwing the scoundrel out option is not available in the EU. So the circle is rounded up. It actually is very painful not to have a democracy when you, when you speak about preserving a democracy. The EU not being a democracy where you can tell those in charge, please do something as a citizen by serving as one of those institutions that you actually need in order to play a role makes this, this whole situation very difficult. So then, so then the, the best long-term perspective for all of us is probably to build a European democracy where our voices could actually be heard. And it's this kind of democracy that make the fight for the rule of law and against the kind of tendencies that we see in Hungary and Poland uh, much, much easier. Then to Costanza, I agree with every single word, of course. And then the reviewers of our, of our case law agreed with, uh, with you more than, uh, than with myself uh, and Laurent as well. So uh, that's why we don't have revolution in the title of, of the case book we've been, working for, or we've been working on for two years. Probably it's not a revolution. But to me, the arguments for the revolution are there. Uh, why? Because Article 19, uh, almost unchanged, existed in the treaties since the first EEC versions. So we see writings of Professor Asher in the 90s. We see, we see the, the writings of several judges uh, in, in the early 2000s, arguing that Article 19 could be revolutionary reinterpreted in the way how it has been reinterpreted three years ago. So when one instrument is unchanged, unchanged for more than 50 years, and suddenly it's given a new meaning, then probably it's more than simply an evolutionary development of the legal system. But of course, the context matters. So I would like to thank Orban and Kaczynski wholeheartedly uh, for helping us to upgrade our constitutional system, at least a little bit. Then uh, to fighting, fighting fire with fire, the whole point, I think, of what Laurent was trying to say is that we don't need it. The trouble is that uh, Ms. von der Leyen and, and other guys in charge uh, simply failed from the start uh, to use the tools that are, that, that are available at hand in order to go against what's going on. So the crisis is not a crisis of the capacities of your law. It's, it's, a, it's an absolute political and moral failure of those in charge of the union uh, to bring us, uh, to bring, uh, to bring us uh, the fruits of, of, the, of the legal and political instruments that we already have at hand. You don't need any kind of uh, re anti-constitutional rethinking of, of the Weimar Constitution. 
You simply need to follow the law. And the commission has been failing throughout uh, on, uh, on bringing, uh, bringing this basic promise uh, to life. Then if, uh, and then and, and the last point on the double standards, and I think the double standards was, 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 was a superb invitation, and I agree with, with Laurent's, uh, uh, Laurent Man, Laurent's mention of it. The trouble is nobody's perfect, of course. So once, once you throw the rule of law a ball into, in, into the hall, uh, it, it will bounce against everybody. And the European Court of Justice itself, in some compositions, will fail to meet the basic rule of law and lawfulness of composition requirements established by the European Court of Human Rights because of what they have done unlawfully with Advocate General Sharpson, because of, because of uh, how uh, the Vice President of the European Court of Justice uh, herself framed the idea of the rule of law as understood by the Court of Justice. And that idea is that those in power, the, the, the masters of the treaties, can do whatever and it will never be reviewable, including going against the treaties, including going against the principles of judicial removability, including tampering with the Court of Justice. So the Court of Justice said, ho, 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 when the sovereign is speaking, uh, it's not up, up to us to correct the sovereign. So this is a deep anti-rule of law understanding, and this is failing to meet the basic criteria of, uh, of being a lawful judge. And in this sense, of course, it's regrettable, but uh, while the rule of law revolution, I will use the word revolution, is ongoing, this revolution somehow is not understood in the same way at the supranational and the national level. And the, the, the very last thing, at, at, the, at, the, at the recent conference, uh, in, in Budapest at, the, at what used to be the Academy of Sciences, which was destroyed by Orban, uh, one, one French call from the Court of Justice uh, offered uh, uh, an, in, an internal understanding of, uh, of the rule of law coming from chambers of one, uh, one of the advocates general of the court, the, uh, one of the real advocates general, not, not the fake uh, uh, Greek and post gentleman. And, uh, and that understanding was, was the following. Uh, Article 19 only applies to constitutional institutions. It doesn't apply to international courts. And if we read the constitution of the EU, actually the EU is an international organization. So you cannot expect the same standards to apply to the court of justice and, uh, and to the national courts. Of course, it contradicts the case, it contradicts the basic promise of Article 19. It's utter rubbish. Uh, uh, this is the only way to justify what the court has been doing to itself in terms of the standards applied, as opposed to uh, Hungary, Poland, France, Spain, and all the countries. Uh, so the last line, the court of justice, particularly in the composition invol involving unlawful imposters on the bench, will not be good enough under its own criteria to ask itself a question using the preliminary ruling procedure. That question would be dismissed as coming from a court doesn't satisfy the, the, the 267 standards. And this is our tragedy. No democracy in the EU and no clear understanding of the rule of law by the, by the president of the Court of Justice himself and the, the constant tampering with the law. Thank you. Thank you. And before, before allowing Professor Pech to, to make the, the final response, let me just quickly weave in one of the questions that we have received from our online participants, which is about the effectiveness of sanctions, which in this is more directed towards China, but I think this is a broader question and perhaps on the effectiveness of sanctions in general, uh, Professor Beck could say one or two words as well. It has been a, a long session, so I'll keep it short. Um, just uh, some uh, quick reactions. I mean, even though we've been talking about the rule of law, uh, first of all, uh, it's important to distinguish between rule by law and rule of law. Uh, so there is a dark side when it comes to the rule by law. Uh, where a lot of abuses can be committed in the name of the rule of law. But what we're talking about is, in fact, rule by law. Speaking of rule of law, actually, to answer the argument that it's too vague, the EU has adopted a very detailed uh, definition, uh, which is to be found in the regulation adopted last December, where respect for human rights is uh, explicitly mentioned. So, um, so essentially, if you're interested by the EU definition of the rule of law, no, I mean, it existed before, but then it, they codified it in one piece of legislation. Um, um, I got to, and then also we've been talking about the rule of law this morning a lot, but in fact, as I was trying to say, this is not simply the rule of law, which is being uh, 
in mind. Uh, he does, uh, we witnessing a systemic structural undermining of democratic principles and respect for human rights. Uh, just remember, Hungary no longer a democracy, uh, according to uh, democracy experts and, uh, and uh, Joe Biden, the US president. Um, and another important point, we've been talking about the EU, but perhaps also worth reminding ourselves that the Council of Europe has also tried and also largely and successfully deal with uh, the process of democratic and rule of law backsliding, not only within the EU, but beyond the EU, we were talking about Ukraine, uh, Turkey. Uh, so uh, the Council of Europe has also largely failed uh, to rise to the challenge. Uh, first time, uh, to our shame, uh, there is an EU member state which is subject also to the special monitoring uh, procedure of the Council of Europe, which is Poland. Uh, regarding Ukraine and Turkey, very quickly, uh, is that going to make uh, their accession to the EU easier? I mean, there was an interesting uh, way of uh, presenting the issue. Um, you could argue that actually Ukraine uh, is more, uh, possibly uh, more compliant uh, with EU values than uh, Hungary. I mean, uh, it, it, it would have seemed uh, a bit uh, ludicrous a few years ago, but not anymore. Now, is that going to help uh, Ukraine? No, not at all. If anything, because of the failure to address rule of law sliding and democratic vaccine within the EU, enlargement is actually going to be a victim of this. There is no way we're going to see any new country joining the EU, I don't know, until uh, Hungary and Poland have been uh, dealt with in a meaningful way. Uh, Turkey, Ukraine, I mean, are we talking about Serbia, uh, Montenegro, Kosovo uh, being uh, possibly before uh, ahead of them in the enlargement uh, pack, but um, there is no way unanimity will be uh, found uh, at least in the next decade. I mean, I could, I could be too pessimistic, but enlargement in a way is a victim of the EU's failure to uh, clean up its own internal mess. Uh, last uh, question and last comment for me, effectiveness of sanction. The EU has barely used uh, sanctions uh, to deal with democratic and rule of law backsliding. Uh, it's only getting there with uh, the ECJ being asked to impose daily penalty payments against Poland. It has to be done more. In the context of China, I simply don't answer the question because I don't know enough about uh, the relationship between the EU and China. But internally, uh, there has been virtually uh, no use of any uh, sanctioning mechanisms. We have seen mostly is uh, denial followed by uh, many reports. So 10 years of uh, denial and 10 years of report has, have brought us to not only one autocratic country in the EU, but now soon we're going to get two and possibly more. Uh, so it's, I would say uh, sanctions is the way to do not to solve the problem, but to contain the problem. Uh, solving the problem will have to be done internally by citizens from the relevant country, but the EU has a role to play like this, the Council of Europe to contain, limit the damage and empower those who are essentially uh, defending values internally. We have to defend police judges, for instance, who are being subject to disciplinary sanctions for the crime of applying EU law. Can you imagine? We have now reached a stage where you get sanctioned, harassed for applying ECJ or uh, ECHR rulings relating to judicial independence. What have we done to ourselves? What have we allowed <clears throat> after 10 years of uh, dialogue and reports? Thank you. Thank you very much. And this also brings sobering as it is to the end of a very interesting and exciting morning session into our lunch break before we meet again at 2.30, not here, but at the premises of the Human Rights Center. Uh, but uh, please join me uh, in a round of applause for our wonderful three panelists.